today, U.S. police under pressure to reform. How do officers answer the nationwide calls for accountability and change? I'm Malika Bilal. I'm Femi O.K. You're in the stream. It's not us. It's the police. This the madness that they spark up. This is what they encourage. This is what they provoke. This is what you get. I don't know when it's going in, but it's for y'all to start. We're not the ones that's killing us. Y'all killing us. We can't make a change if y'all don't change. Milwaukee is the latest U.S. city to erupt over a police killing of a black person. Over the past two years, these deaths have sparked a movement demanding law enforcement reform. Some cases were caught on video. Several ended in non-indictments or acquittals. All of this has sown mistrust and a perception of police as racially biased and acting with impunity. Today, a roundtable of police officers on the demands for reform. Joining us right here in our studio, Graham Weatherspoon is a retired New York City Police Department detective. Detective Derek Waller is also with the NYPD. And in Seattle, Washington, Betty Taylor, an educator and former police chief in the city of Winfield in the U.S. state of Missouri. Welcome, everybody. Good to have you here in the stream. Thank, Thank you so much. Good to All be right. Here. We're going to make you work immediately. <laughs> Malia. Right. Dig right in. Uh, yeah. um, so uh, we got a video comment from a former police officer out of Baltimore. And I want to preface this by showing you something on my laptop. He became pretty po prominent with this tweet from 2015, um, where he started uh, whistleblowing basically uh, uh, tweeting all the experiences he had seen uh, through his time in the Baltimore police force. And so here is the comment he left us on what average everyday policing looked like for him. After 11 years of climbing through the ranks and streets of Baltimore, it's a hard pill to swallow that we may have been our own worst enemy. We occupy neighborhoods as a militant wing of a war on people called the war on drugs. We are judged by how many human beings we put in the prison cells. We fight crime not by addressing the causes, rather by hunting the symptoms with tools that only worsen the conditions, ensuring we never actually succeed. We end up serving political motivations to the few as opposed to the many that we put that badge on our chest to protect. The radical revolution in policing must be in the civilian-led model. So, Derek. How, how does his description of what he saw gel with uh, what you've seen? Wow, it, I mean, that, that, that he's, on, he's on point. I mean, I've had similar experience with that. And it's like, you know, there, there's so much pressure. There's so much pressure on police officers to lock people up. I mean, our judgment is taken away from us, and, and we just, we, we basically are forced to lock people up. A lot of times for no reason at all. It all comes down to the quota. You know, police officers are actually forced to lock people up. How are you forced? Who's making it? Uh, comes from the higher echelon of the police department, you know? And if you don't do these things, I mean, you, you face retaliation. And when you make a retaliation complaint through the police department, nothing's done because that complaint actually goes to the police commissioner's desk and it just sits there. Yeah, you know, yes. th there have always been quotas in policing. Always have, and there always will be. Um, I came on the job way ahead of Derek. I came on in the mid-70s when there was high crime in New York City. Police officers were dying at the rate of one every month, and we've had them as close as back-to-back -back days, and I've carried caskets. Um, I refuse to get into a lot of the quota nonsense because if there's no crime, then I'm doing my job. If I'm on a post and no crime has been committed, you can't expect me to have paperwork. And my job, the, the uniform officer's job, as taught in the academy, is to deter the crime. The presence of the police officer is to deter crime. People feel safer when they see police officers. And we haven't gotten to the point where people are so stupid as they're going to rob the bank while the police officer is standing on the corner. <laughs> so when a, when a police officer is on a post and there is no criminal activity, he has done his job. There is no need to ask him, well, why didn't you give out the summons? Why didn't you make an arrest? If there's no activity as a result of his presence, the police are doing their job. Mm. Okay, I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you an example of this. I had a, uh, I had a uh, officer fresh out the academy, and he says, uh, "Wow, I work with him. My partner was off that day. Literally, literally two weeks out the academy, he remembers it specifically because it was winter. He says, "Wow, you know, I feel the pressure already from these quotas. And, and you know what? Somebody told me I was on the lieutenant's list, and and." I don't even know how to write summonses yet. And he says, I'm already on the lieutenant's list for having low activity, you know? So this is something that trickles down from the top to the officers. Wow. Uh, so, you know? so, Betty, you're a former police uh, chief. So, chief. so um, this idea of quotas, so I go to work and what do I have to do? Well, you have to make money for your department to get uh, better equipment, uh, 
to get better training. You get, you have to, I, I come from Missouri and Missouri is an at will state. So there's no job security unless you're a sheriff. So you can get fired uh, really quickly. You, you there's no contract. Oh, yes. You can just like, you know, two weeks later, thank you, goodbye. That's yes. what at will and, means. You know, I went to uh, the, my, my um, city council and asked for better cars. Our cars kept breaking down and they told me, yeah. write more tickets. Wow. Oh, okay. so, yeah, yeah go, go on, buddy. Go ahead, go ahead. So, uh, and, and that was one of the, the things. I'm glad I'm here because I come from small town policing and with small town policing, it's a whole different ball game, especially in Missouri. It was uh, a few years ago in our constitution, we couldn't even unionize uh, Missouri state constitution that police officers couldn't even have a union. So there was no job security. And policing is a passion-based occupation. You've got to be in it for the right reasons. You've got to want to be there. And then you're, but these um, certain city councils or uh, high, our commissioners feel that they need you to have to produ produce revenue and make it more of a business. So here's, than, a, here's an idea, and I, I don't know if it's, it's your idea. That. What about if you just had more money in the police department, then you would stop writing people tickets and quotas for nonsense? Even if police officers are paid higher, yeah. that bill has to be paid, all right? right? So the city has to take in revenue. They take in revenue through real estate tax. They take in revenue from sales tax. They take in rev revenue from parking tickets. They take in revenue from fines levied against mm -hmm. an individual who's been arrested. This is ge revenue wow. generating agency. This is messed up. The, that's what the police department it's is. A it's a business. One, so basically, it is basically a what you yes. have, it, it, it's, it's a major business and it's, it's more like a mafia. The police department is basically a mafia. Oh. So what you have is, as police officers, we're all given what's called a tax number. And no matter whether you're a police officer, sergeant, you get promoted up the ranks, that tax number stays with you. So each tax number basically makes revenue for the city by writing summonses and locking Yikes. people up. You get locked up, you go to court, you got to pay a court fee. I mean, there's, there's money every step of the game with the police department. And when you stop making that money for the city, they come after you by transfers, by lower valuations, mm -hmm. by trying to fire you for low infractuations. Yes. You know? So it's, it's, it's a lot going on. And when you speak out about it, they'll, they'll, they'll come after you. They really come after you. Oh. You know, so many officers are going through this retaliation, but they're so scared, scared. They're in fear to come out. They don't want to speak about it. Wow. Yeah. Actually, actually, there's laws, there, there, there's, there's, there's interim orders that say we're not allowed to speak out about certain things going on in the police department. They want you to uh, go through the police commission or the police department to get permission to speak You're out. You're not even allowed areas. to tell about the bad no. things that are happening. Your constitutional mm. rights, they are attempting to restrict the constitutional rights and safeguards of the police officer by denying him the right to speak. And this is something I fought against when I was in the department. Oh my and I tell officers, you have to speak because they can't take you your job to. from you. I got a right. pension. I yeah. spoke. I yeah. challenged the police commissioner and the mayor of the city of New York. I, I, I collected my pension. And the people trust, or tr well, they used to mm. trust the police officers. The Norman Rockwell days are gone, all right? Right. We need to Which build like, that trust for, for, and bring it back. For people who are outside of America, don't know Americana, those beautiful old Americana yes, it, pictures yes. and like a picket, white picket fence and the well, dog you know, hopping you know up. I, I, actually, I want to interject here because you said something that is a perfect segue to some things we're hearing online. You said people used to trust the police. I would say a majority of people that are tweeting us do not anymore. Here are some of those reasons. This is Kimberly. She says, uh, one of the problems is this comply or die type attitude, accepting any police action if the citizen isn't 100% obedient on say like a traffic right. stop. We did not always used to accept this. Mm -hmm. Another reason, this is another problem someone uh, brings up, Gopi says, for starters, police need to show a commitment towards using non-lethal force while encountering situations. Use negotiation rather than force. So take us through a traffic stop and, and what, what the first person meant about comply or die. You have you 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 have you have several type of traffic stops and basically right. they're born they they boil down to stopping a white person and stopping a, a person of color oh because it's, it's let me total, hold on. total different stops. Betty, do you agree with that? I agree. All right. Okay. Okay. It's it's Yikes. you know when a, when when a, when a person of color is stopped, it's just assumed they're up to something. There's a firearm in the car, so it's two different stops. When you when you when you stop a, a, a white person. It's like that that level just drops down to a comfort level. All right, so that's so why I'm, a lot of these incidents yeah, I'm gonna play. I'm going to play, uh, no, Betty, you play the white person, um, and okay. then Graham, you stop Betty. How, okay. would that, how would that go, that interaction okay. go? Good afternoon, ma'am. 
Why'd you stop me? Uh, basically, I stopped you because you failed to signal when you turned the corner back there on 4th and Main. Uh, could I see your license and your registration, please? Well, sure, here it is. Thank you very much, ma'am. I'll be right back. Now, I go back, I run the play. Uh -huh. Now, I may come back, yeah. and I may give her a warn and an admonishment. Okay. Look, you, you, you have a clean record. Uh, just be careful, pay attention to you know, what you're doing, and have a good day. All right, so that's white person stop. I play black person being stopped. Derek, stop me. <laughs> you ready for this? Yeah. Okay, you're driving. <laughs> uh, uh, we're live on TV. Watch the language. Oh, uh, you're just driving around. You have a nice car. It's tinted. Sure. You didn't do nothing wrong. Right. And I feel like I need to write a summons today. Yeah. And I pull you over and um, Hello, tell you to roll your windows down. Right. Uh, you have some ID? Uh, uh, do yeah. You have some ID? I, I, I have ID. Why did you stop me? Uh, you wear your tail lights out. Just give me your ID. Okay. Here you go. I have your ID. I walk back to the car. Yeah. Um, what I should do is write a summons for whatever infraction, right. but I'm going to run your name because I'm just assuming you're a minority. I'm you're going to pop on a warrant. So, uh -oh. you know, I, I, I run your name, nothing pops. I give you back your ID and I say, you know, have a nice day. And we do that often. We do that often. Yeah. That's done often mm -hmm. in the police department. They do just, you're supposed to stop every fourth car, but they stop every car that looks suspicious. You know, when you do these traffic stops. My you're attorney to... was stopped mm -hmm. in midtown Manhattan. In standing traffic, he was driving a Lexus S500 or whatever it was. This is a number of years back. He is a former assistant district attorney for New York County. And the CEO, the, the head of a law firm in Manhattan, that had, he had 30 attorneys working beneath him in his firm. The police are questioning, well, where'd you get this car? Well, it says Lexus. Oh, you're a smart so-and-so. He said, very smart. Let me have your license and registration. They wrote him a summons for going through a red light. He's standing in traffic going nowhere. Wow. He said, I'll see you later, officer. Have a good day. Now, he went to court. Of course, the summons was thrown out. He contacted Internal Affairs, and that cop was taken to the wood chipper only because Bruce is a former assistant district attorney, a former bureau chief, and an attorney operating a law firm in Midtown Manhattan. If he'd been anyone else. Anybody else, you'd have had the ticket and you'd have had to pay the summons and have the points on your license. So that's a point I actually, that brings me to this tweet from Dwayne, and I'll throw this to you, Betty. Um, Dwayne says, becoming a police officer is a chosen profession and it comes with inherent dangers. But he continues by saying, while my skin color was not chosen and cannot be changed, you can see his skin color in this profile picture right there. The question then is, why should my skin color come with inherent dangers? So the pushback to that, uh, because there is pushback online, uh, we uh, chat with a police officer out of Maine, uh, Caucasian. His name is Matt, and we asked him about addressing corruption and racism within police ranks, and his answer was, I don't think it exists. I think anti-police people want to believe it does, but in my experience, I've never seen it. Uh, do, you, do you interact with people like Matt and other police officers who say yes. this is made up? Yes, and I came into policing from a whole different standpoint. I come from a high crime, high poverty area, um, and uh, I've been around African Americans my whole life. But there are Caucasian officers that have never interacted and, and have that not knowing uh, when, they, when they deal with people of color. Um, and I can give you an example. My husband's from Jennings in the Ferguson area, and uh, he got his driver's license at 16. By 21, he'd already lost his driver's license and was still paying on the tickets. Wow. That was the old Jennings Police Department that is now defunct, but um, because St. Louis County had to come and take them over. So um, I, I can see that, but it, uh, some officers just don't understand because they've never been around it. They don't understand how it is to, have, to be discriminated against because they never have been. You take someone's a middle-class white officer, doesn't understand the, the how people have to live a certain way. So here's, here's, a, here's a disturbing part about this. Uh, Betty and, and Derek and Graham, you're, you're sharing these kind of horrific insider stories. How do you combat something as very simple as a white person gets stopped in a very different way from the way a black person gets stopped? How do you even address that? But you were saying that some officers, they don't even know that they have these prejudices. 
Right. They don't know their biases. They don't they don't know them because they're not honest with them enough to say, OK, I, they don't understand that they have they've never lived in a, in a neighborhood where they had their electric turret shut off or they didn't have money for groceries or mom selling the EBT the food stamp card for uh, drugs or whatever. They've never had those experiences. They right. don't know who they're policing. Yeah, she's she's right on point. There are police officers that I met in New York City that had never interacted with a black person until they came into the academy. When I was in the academy 42 years ago, at John Jay College, there was a class that everybody had to take, and it was on African American studies. A an Irish guy said, what do we have to take this for? Black people don't have any history. OK? And I can tell you about Irish history, because they were the white trash of Europe as far as the British were concerned. And when they came here, they were the not even white, because Irish were not allowed to associate with white people in the United States when they came You're here. You're still telling me, so, telling me horror stories from the inside. But we had a knockdown brawl in that lecture hall at right. John Jay College. Right. And when the dust cleared, all the white boys were sitting in the front row to get an education. Oh. Understand? Okay. We have this country will not look at the cancer that's been eating at the foundation of this country since its inception, and it is racism. Yeah, you know, there, there's something that actually that's embedded in America, embedded in policing that needs to be broken up because there's, there's different type of policing in different like, type of neighborhoods. Where I work, you know, in, where, where I work in, in Brooklyn, there's, there's like overly aggressive policing, and the, and the, and the people that are subjected to that, they hate police officers. Where I work, they absolutely hate police officers. Now, you go to Williamsburg, where it's a predominantly Jewish neighborhood, and the policing is totally different because you start doing the same policing in those areas, they start making phone calls and, and, and their voice gets heard. So in these neighborhoods of color, they, they have no voice. You know, they make a phone call, you know, no, nobody's gonna listen to them. So you mentioned New yeah. York. I, I wanna play a comment that we received from a council mem member, uh, city council member, Ruben Wills out of Queens. Um, here's how he thinks this could begin to be addressed. I believe one step in doing that would be to increase the diversity within the NYPD rank and file as well as commanding officers. We know through statistics that whites make up more than half of the NYPD at around 54%. We know that blacks are at 16%, Hispanics are at 24%, and Asians hover around 4%. Uh, another step in doing this, I believe, would be by encouraging more officers to do patrols on foot, uh, establish better relationships one-on-one -on -one with local residents, the community leaders, faith-based leaders, as well as business owners in those particular communities. How um, far would increasing diversity go? Um, you know what? And increasing diversity, that, that has a lot to do with it, but it also has to do with the training mm -hmm. because the training and the definition of police officers need to be changed because, well, you know, the, 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 what, what people, what, what the, the poli police department says a good police officer is, is that officer who comes with those numbers, okay? You know, they, they, don't, they don't think about community interaction, like how you do as a police officer. We basically judge on that. And, the, and when, when these new officers come out of the academy, they're basically taught you come to work to arrest people. And that's not our job. We don't come to work to arrest people and they need to, to train these young officers. That's not your job. Your job is to protect and serve. You know, like, like, like the gentleman said, standing on the corner um, in uniform is, is stopping crime in itself. Period. I'm wondering, is this the key Please. to why, and I only say this as a civilian, why policing isn't working in the United States? It's because what is seen as a good police officer is not what you see as a good police officer. No, it's not numbers, all right? It's not quotas, it's not stops. If you can it's interact, not making money. Right. If you can interact with people. Mm. There, we were talking about this on the way down here. My partner and I were in a fight years ago. Two of us fighting five guys. Not balanced, but we were <laughs> fighting, all right? Yep. I heard two thuds behind me, and as I turned, it was the guy that I had arrested in 1978. He was on parole when I arrested him for a felony. That guy came to back me up. He said, Spoon, I saw you and your partner. The odds were not even. I had to even it out. He introduced me to his wife. He said, you helped me turn my life around. The penal code of the state of New York said that, is th that the penal law is not to be strictly construed but used to the fair department of justice, which means that people can be given a latitude of grace. They don't have to be held to every letter of the law. 
And when you do that, when you show people that you care, nobody was drafted by the police department. I voluntarily went, he went, Betty went. We all chose we to all do this. On the line. All right? And if your yeah. heart is not there to be the servant to the people, you don't belong there. It's not about so ruling and, and having control over people. Betty? Yeah, but so many times in law enforcement, it becomes us against them instead of us for them. Cool. Yeah. And that's what's happened a lot. And when we say, I, I taught in St. Louis City, uh, I taught policing uh, right down the road from the Michael Brown uh, shooting incident uh, right after it happened. And I'm telling these, I, I find policing it was, is the greatest profession ever when it's done right. And um, I try to help my young, young students to get into policing. But then you look at an application, the application sometimes has discriminatory hiring practices where it has, um, we want to know about your relatives, we want to know about your cousins. You have no, uh, someone that's 21, or, or they have no control over the cousins or the uncles, but you're asking you know, about their criminal history. I see why they do it, because they don't want to hire someone from the moment, but you're sometimes an insider. You become a better police officer like myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I come from a, a very rough background, but I brought that to me in policing, and I brought that compassion that I knew about from being on the other side. Okay. So when we say we need to police our own communities, we do need to police our own communities, but you need to make sure your hiring practices don't discriminate. Right, right. Uh, and let me and let me let me hit on that. Um, let's let, am, am, am I am I precinct where I work? Let's say there's a shooting in front of Building A. Okay. The police department, just to say we did something in that area, any any minority that walks past that building is going to get stopped. Whether he has something to do with it, whether he's never ever been on that block before in his life, he's going to get stopped for spitting. He's going to get stopped for jaywalking. Just so the police department can say we did A, B, C, and D because of this shooting. And and in time, as you keep doing this, um, these, these young these young. Uh, 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 men of color who live in that neighborhood, their, their records are screwed for the rest of their life because of that one stop exactly. question frisk, because so of that just, one summons. Let me just remind people that you are a serving police officer in NYPD. How can you even say this and then go back to work? Um, I, I've been retaliated against for years. I mean, it's not much they can do to me that they haven't already done. You know, I'm, I'm speaking out as, as a civilian about my tenure with the police department, my 21 years with the police department and presently working with them. So I'm not here representing the police department. I'm here speaking out as an officer who's worked with that corrupt department for these, these amount of years. I want to play you a video comment we got from a son of a police officer. Um, I'll direct this to you, Graham. This is Lawrence, and he has a way to move this conversation forward just a little bit. Have a listen. Awesome. Hello, my name is Lawrence Grandpree. I'm the son of a cop, but also a police reform advocate working here in Baltimore, Maryland. While the Department of Justice has just arrived, in the piece I work for The Guardian, my group consistently explains that local and state law and actually internal disciplinary procedures that determine a big chunk of police discipline and reestablishing trust with the community. My question to you is, is that if policing is a public service paid for with public money, shouldn't we, must we, have a system of public accountability when police are accused of wrongdoing, such as having trained non-police officers instead of police officers themselves deciding if cops get fired? I agree, I agree. You, what, what, you, this, that's hot, <laughs> that's hot. Who wants to I, answer I, I, it? I, I think, <laughs> Woo. and I've, I said, love I've said this for years. Said, Lawrence, thank you for the comment. I didn't come to the Ponderosa to tell Ben Cartwright how to run the ranch. I'm a hired hand on this ranch. All right? I'm not running the ranch. I don't lord over the people. I believe, for instance, in New York, we have a civilian complaint review board, which is a toothless tiger. Mm -hmm. People file complaints factually. A friend of mine was an attorney on the civilian so complaint Graham, review I'm board. I'm going to ask you to wrap up your story in, in a sentence okay. because we're, we're out of time. It takes nine to, nine to ten months before you get a response from the civilian complaint mm -hmm. review board. Mm -hmm. When they come with a finding, they have no way, they have had no way to discipline that cop or even now they're about to give them the power You're to arrest to these Gray, police officers and take them, out of, take them out of, of service with the detective. department. We also and have Detective Derek have Waller right. here. I want to Betty I Taylor jump on. as well. And Betty uh, Taylor was a former police chief. You hear that, right? This show needs a part two. I'm going to talk to Malika, oh, people behind the scenes. <laughs> I'm going for a part serious. two. The guests want a part eight. I think we can compromise. Thank you for watching. We'll be online. Stream.outofzero.com. See you soon.